Welcome back to What's the Business with Brian and Brandy. This is episode two. Trying out a couple of different things with our audio setup to make sure that we get the best setup that we're most comfortable with. One thing that we're realizing with our audio setup that sounds really strange is chairs are squeaky. And so we're going to have to get new chairs. Today's episode, we are going to discuss how to find your ideal client, who you should be selling to. Because that's the most important part of your marketing efforts is figuring out who exactly you're selling to. So that's what's the business. I'm Brian. I'm Brandy. We'll get to you after the intro. Peace. business we get into uh, what's the business with your business on days when we have guests on days where we do not have guests and it's just me and brandy we will be discussing different ideas and concepts of business and marketing for small business owners to help you either get a foothold or get a stranglehold or get a chokehold or get the cobra clutch on your marketing cobra clutch the cobra clutch a little sergeant slaughter move on your marketing you know you want to get it under control and so this episode episode is really about the most important step in your marketing process. And it's something that a lot of people overlook. So Brandy, if I say, who are you, who are you marketing to, you know, as a business owner, what do you think of when I say, who are you marketing to? The people. The people. And that's one aspect of it. That is the larger aspect of it. You, you factor in your people, but then you also figure out where your people are and what channel you're going to use to reach your people and stuff like that. And in order to figure all that stuff out, there's some other steps that you need to take to lay out exactly who you're marketing to. And that's where we talk about the way, best way I've heard to describe is having a client avatar. Now, avatar, y'all seen the movie, right? Where dude does like dances with wolves in outer space (laughs) and ends up becoming Mr. Blue and ends up being better at all aspects of life than the blue people that have been living the life the whole time. (laughs) And basically what it was, was he was using that blue... Navi. It's been a long time since I've seen the movie. We're talking about when my daughter was born. That was the first, that was one of the first movies we went to go see after our firstborn was born. And so, but basically the blue creature that he inhabits is the avatar for him. You know, it's your representation. So knowing that before we get into it, Brandy, I say avatar. What does that mean to you? When I say client avatar, what does that mean to you? My most ideal person. Yeah. Your most ideal client. So you're going to sit down when you're talking about your client avatar. And I want you to get really, really, really granular with this one. You're about to see how deep the rabbit hole goes on this. one. It's about making sure that you are covering all aspects. And I know that there's there are companies out there that their client avatar has a name and a job and an address and kids and, you know, you know, all the other aspects of what builds out, you know, whether they have kids or no kids or whatnot, all the aspects of what builds out their life. And they get super, super deep into this is specifically who this product is for. Now, there's a benefit to that. And, you know, I'm asking Brandy because because I have a lot. I can start talking and get over everybody's about this stuff. And so I'm asking her as a buffer (laughs) to see. So if I say, you know, what what benefit would you have to giving your client avatar a name and age and occupation? What, why would I do that? What what would be the purpose of that? So for when you're creating a product or certain marketing idea, you can kind of sit back and basically pretend like you're having a conversation with this person and get there, you know, kind of see how it flows, you know, how think of think in a way this person would possibly think of your product or service. Right. It allows you to get that laser focus on that individual, because at the end of the day, we talked about it before. If you're marketing to everybody, you're marketing to nobody. 
And it's really important, specifically when you're talking about marketing or marketing budgets, you have a certain amount of money that you're going to be able to spend on ads and other things, especially if you're doing pay per click ads. Every time somebody clicks on the ad, that money comes out of your budget, you know, and so you want to make sure that the people seeing that ad are people that are likely to buy your product or service or engage in something that's going to benefit your company, maybe at getting onto your mailing list or going to your website. You want to make sure that they're just not kicking tires and they're going to be engaged clients. And so you want to make sure that you kind of nail down who that person is so that you're not just shotgunning (laughs) a bunch of unwanted marketing materials into somebody's inbox. I get those all the time because I'm a marketer. And so I, I look at different marketing campaigns, whether I have interest in them or not. Sometimes I want to look at them and kind of see what the skeletons are. And I get weird things that scroll across my Facebook feed as a result. I'll explain how that works because that's retargeting and that's another aspect of another tool that you can throw in your toolbox when you have your ideal client laid out. So I'll explain retargeting and how that works specifically on Facebook a little bit later on. We'll do that in another podcast. No, we can actually do it in this one because it's not a heck of a whole lot of information. (sighs) Yeah, you heard, if you could hear an eye roll, that's that's what it sounds like. You just heard an eye roll. I'm just trying to make us have more episodes in your making me do it all in one. I'm pulling rank. Oh. Because <laughs> I'm the boss. Okay. Yeah. That's what, I'm what you think that. That's Y'all, what you think. The crown falls heavy on the head of those who wear it. And sometimes you have to have the neck muscles to hold it up. I hope y'all hear that I roll too. <laughs> so when we're talking about um, this concept of client avatar, it's really important to sit down and, and spend some time with it. If you already have a book of business or you already have a pool of clients, sit down and start figuring out what things, you know, if you, you know, if you don't have a CRM, this is probably a good reason to have one. This allows you to kind of sort who your clients are. You can start piecing together uh, specifically, you know, commonalities, what industry they're in, age groups, demographics, you know, all the stuff that, that, that lumps people together, you're going to want to find out. You're going to find out what, how much money they, you know, probably possible ideas of how much income they're bringing in. You can kind of use, you can, what common services do they buy? A lot of those kind of things are going to help inform who your client avatar is so you can really build it out. If you're not, if you haven't, if you don't have a book of business or you don't have a pool of clients, now is the time to actually start sitting down and thinking, who is this business for? Who ideally do is going to be the person that's going to be buying this? The reason Go ahead. Or if you've done kind of a, a test market kind of run, you know, say you're a, a, someone who's crafty and you've done craft shows and things like that, you know, think about who comes to your table more. You know, is it young adults there, you know, the kids there with their parents or is it more of your your grandmothers looking for gifts or something? Just start really looking at that potential client or the people who have already purchased from you in a different way. Do that, you know, what common features do they have in like age range, things of that nature. Understand that this cross section of data is hugely important. And it's so important that let me let me break this down for you. Why do you think Facebook brought, bought Instagram in the first place? For more people. For more people. They bought it for the data that Instagram collected on its users. So email addresses, those email addresses are as valuable as gold to Facebook, but also they get to categorize things that they like, things that they dislike, who they follow, what products they follow, what brands they'll tag in their in in their Instagram posts and things like that, because it allows them to feed those in to Facebook as algorithm so that they can target you for products. So let's say, you know, specifically on Facebook, let's say there's a new movie dropping. Like I know for me, I'm a big nerd when it comes to the movie Predator, like the whole Predator franchise. I've seen pretty much all of them. When the new Predator movie dropped instantly, I saw the trailer. I give a like to that trailer. Me giving that like to that trailer 
on Facebook tells them a couple things about me. One, I'm a male more than like more likely than not, because that's who the target demographic is for a lot of action movies, especially those 80s era franchises that have, that have kind of carried over. It's going to give them maybe some hints at my age and they're going to cross reference that with other things I liked, other groups I'm involved in, other posts I responded to. And now they have a, a profile of me that they can actually use when people are building out ads. And that's the power of it. It's spooky. It sounds weird, but they can basically build a profile off you. They can, you know, they can look at what movies you watch, what TV shows you watch, what groups you're in, what kind of soda you drink and where you live and basically create an entire profile all the way down to what they think your political leanings are. And Facebook does it. And that's the data that is valuable to advertisers. So. If it's that valuable to Facebook, it should be at least as valuable to you as a business owner that you spend time sitting around and thinking about the who is, who you're selling to. And you can do it pretty much in any industry across the board. And just because you come up with a who, does that mean, Randy, does not mean just because you come up with a specific client avatar? Does that mean that that's the only person you ever sell to? That's the only kind of people you ever sell to? No. A lot of times you will sell to an individual that meets majority of those check marks. So if you have like 10, they'll maybe mark off seven to eight. You won't find the perfect 10 each and every time, but majority of them will check off more than half of the the boxes of your ideal person. And then, yeah, from then from there, they'll start giving you more people because that ideal person associates with more people like them. Right. The thing is, you're going to want and now we'll, after the break, we'll kind of say, OK, now you have all this information compiled and you've sat down. You put a lot of time and energy figuring out who and built a client avatar. You've given them a name. You've given a couple of occupations. You've given them the income level, education level and all this other stuff. You've given them all of this stuff. Now, what do you do with it? So we're going to take a brief pause for the cause and we will come right back. So when I wanted to get started in the podcasting game, I was looking at different platforms. And I had done podcasts before, and I was looking at something that would allow me to get started as quickly as possible. Because when you're a small business owner, momentum is everything. Things that allow you to get started without a lot of scenes or steps allow you to feel some success early on, and it encourages you to keep pushing through. And that's where Anchor comes in. Anchor is the platform that I use. It's a free platform that gives you all the tools you need to get started with your podcast journey. There's all kinds of creation tools that allow you to edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer, so it's always at your fingertips. And Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many other providers. So it allows you to make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership, and that's huge. That's what I'm talking about with getting that momentum. So... If you want to get started and have everything you need to make a podcast in one place, then download the free Anchor app or go to Anchor FM to start your journey. Thanks for tuning in. Back to the show. Listen, I'm going to let you in on a secret. If you're a business owner and you're trying to try something new and different with your marketing, you really need to look at audio podcasting and video podcasting. And the difference is, you know, video podcasting is going to include a video platform like YouTube, but it's pretty much the same thing. Here's what I'm going to tell you. It's a fantastic opportunity that not a lot of business owners are taking advantage of. It's a new frontier, y'all. And what does I sell words do? Well, what do we do, Brian? What we do is we help you create your podcast. Whether you want to use just an audio based podcast or a video podcast, really doesn't matter to us. We're concerned about getting you launched. 
so that you can have your own platform to talk about your product or service. The reality is the reason why podcasting is such a major opportunity that not a lot of business owners are taking seriously yet, we're going to say yet, is because they don't know that with podcasting, you can either have your own radio station or your own television station and you control the messaging, you control the commercials, you control the guests, you control the sponsors. It's your own platform to speak directly to your listeners. We're seeing it play all over the world, on YouTube especially. In YouTube world, business owners left and right are utilizing YouTube video podcasting to attract new clients, talk about new services, and share their expertise and build trust with their clients. And so this is an opportunity for you as a business owner to get in and talk about the business that you love and build trust with prospective clients. So why wouldn't you? I don't know. Like, so podcasting is the new, it's the new air fryer (laughs) for business. Contact us and we could talk about an alternative for your traditional marketing. So hit us up. The email is mail, M A I L, at isellwords.net. That is M A I L at I S E L L W O R D S dot net. Hit us up and we can sit down and talk about what your podcasting future looks like. Back to the show. All right, y'all, we're back. So in my fervor and my excitement about discussing the client avatar, I neglected a key component of something that you're going to have to do with this client avatar. So Brandy, my, my beautiful wife, let me know, you know, and she's really hesitant to point out when I do something wrong. So it was really jarring. Really? <laughs> You sure about that? Don't lie, don't lie to these people. It was a it was a complete and utter shock when she pointed out something I neglected to do. That's because you're a perfectionist and you don't think you do anything wrong. You're right. Mm-hmm. So this is me not doing it wrong. Randy, what didn't we talk about? We didn't talk about any of the information that you should possibly consider gathering. We hinted to a couple of things, but not really explaining what it is that you're looking for to help you produce this client avatar. Okay. So what do we need to be looking for? So first of all, you're looking for all types of uh, demographic information. So whether your product or service is to geared directed toward a man or a woman, a child, is it geared to a specific culture, ethnicity? It is the person, what is that person's education level? Where do they reside? Are they geographically, are they more someone who would live in urban America or rural America? What is one of the big things we kept hitting on? was income. What is their average income for this person? Also, another thing to think of is, are they married? Are they single, divorced, widowed? What is their marital status? What is definitely their their age range? I think I said that already. Are they, do they have children or not? Maybe even possibly grandchildren. Are they pet lovers? If they, ha- you know, if they have a pet, is a cat, a dog, a bird, something exotic? You know, what? status of car do they they drive? I mean, there is so much information you can put together. Do they own a house or do they rent or, or do they rent? Think of all the things that you really need to know in order to create your product or service. And then start really breaking that out to that ideal client and putting in there, you know, 
the ideal tiers for those clients because like I said earlier, some of them may check all 10 marks and those are usually going to be your top tier clients. And I'm going into a whole nother segment of what utilizing your avatar. So actually I'm going to stop myself at this moment because that's a whole, I think it's another podcast. Now Bryce probably going to say, no, we can do it in this segment. And then I'm going to eye roll again and you'll hear it in the podcast. Well, the thing is with the avatar, the avatar is an amalgam of all those things. And basically you're combining those things and you're saying, okay, this is the perfect client for my specific product. You know, I want, you know, when I, when I think of the people that buy this product, this is exactly who I have in mind. Now, the reason why you want to do this stuff is because when you have a good idea of the who, you know where to reach them. Are they on Facebook? Are they on Twitter? Are they on Instagram? Are they TikToking? Are they YouTubers? You know, do they read the classified ads? Do they are they in Craigslist? Are they eBay shoppers? It allows you to really figure out exactly where your audience resides so that you can sell specifically to them because you don't have to be on all these platforms y'all and i think that's the thing that a lot of marketers try to bullshit you with where you have to have a presence on all these different platforms you don't if you don't know how to use it and your clients aren't there you really don't need to be on there unless you're curious about it i mean unless you're kind of exploring it to see if you can actually utilize it but if your clients are you know, 60 and above, it doesn't make a heck of a whole lot of sense to be Snapchatting with them unless you found a pocket of 60 year olds that meet your 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 avatar criteria and they're on Snapchat, then you can knock yourself out. But more times than not, you know, your Snapchatters, your TikTokers and stuff like that is going to be a younger demographic crowd. And so if that who if that's who falls into that bracket, that's where you need to be. Does that make sense? Make sense? Yes. You know, you need a map. You need a location. If you're going over your friend's house, it helps to know where their address, right? It helps to know their address. And this is you just getting the address of the people that you want to interact with. That's a good analogy of knowing how and where they reside. Right. And you want to know how they communicate. You know, it's one of those things where a lot of times we we think that we can get people cross channel. But if somebody isn't really into YouTube, you're not going to use you're not going to drag them over to YouTube to watch content. You need to put the content where they are. So if most of the time their stuff is consumed on LinkedIn, you need to be present. If your avatar is on LinkedIn, that's where you need to be. That's the importance of the avatar. It also helps you test out products. So as you come up with new ideas for new product lines or new services or whatnot, you can quickly see if this product or service passes the smell test because you say, well, this will my avatar buy this. Well, no, then I don't need to sell it. That makes sense. Understand this. I mentioned it and I kind of hinted towards it. These social media platforms had different demographic groups on them. And so you need to make sure that you are speaking to the right demographic groups. Now, specifically, I touched on Facebook and I talked about retargeting. Retargeting is somebody comes to your Web page, right? Mm-hmm. They fit within the demographic group or the, the avatar group that you're trying to attract. Facebook sees that you make an ad for a service, right? right. Facebook sees that and you have your, your different demographics laid out in your ad. And we're going to talk about building Facebook ads and the nuts and bolts of that. If you're interested in another podcast, let us know what's the email address. They can contact us if they're interested in that. They can contact us again at mail at isowords.net. That's M-A-I-L at I-S-E-L-L-W-O-R-D-S dot net. If you're interested in the 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 nuts and bolts of creating Facebook ads. But at the end of the day, you create a Facebook ad, you can put an option in there that's called retargeting where it finds people that have visited your website within the last, it goes 30, 90, 180 days. 
and it will reshow them that ad for a product or service or another product or service that's like yours, depending on how many ads you have running. It's a really powerful tool to catch people that might have had passing interest in your website, because a lot of times we'll go to a website and completely forget about it. We're interested in the product, but something else comes up. Dog ran away. I don't know. One of the kids set the kitchen on fire. You got of got diverted from what you're looking at and you come back and you're, you know, you kind of click off the page. Retargeting is great for people that had a passing interest in your business. They visit your website and Facebook will reserve them that ad. I know a lot of people who are spooked by the idea of I clicked on this website to look at some new pajamas and now the ads for the pajamas are in my Facebook feed. And that's weird. <laughs> Don't worry. That's that's the whole, what is it, the cookies that they collect? Yeah. Yeah, you're leaving them crumbs on all the websites you go to. But uh, you've been you've been successfully retargeted because that 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 business is running a Facebook ad that says serve this ad to anybody who's on Facebook that visits our page. Amazon's a great one. Am- I get Amazon ads all up and down my feed because I'm constantly on Amazon, whether I'm buying or not. I'm on Amazon. <laughs> right. And that's the thing. I mean, and it's not just big companies that can do it. As a small business, you have the ability to retarget, but your ability to retarget is really contingent upon you nailing your avatar for your business. So you can go in there and narrow down the statistics or specifications of of who you're attracting in the first place. Yeah. You know, you want to attract people that are kind of interested in what you're selling in the first place. They go visit your website. They click off to go do something else. They log back on the Facebook. Boom, the ad and the ad for your service is sitting right there. And that frequency kind of gets it starts putting it in the front of their mind. And now you have an interested client who's going to be reaching out to you. It happens all the time and it's kind of creepy, but it is how Facebook works. And like I said, as a small business owner, you can leverage that and utilize that for an investment in Facebook ads. You know, Facebook, <laughs> Instagram, YouTube, all of them actually do it. Yeah, they do it. YouTube does it pretty well. Instagram ads are pretty good. Twitter is, ugh, they're still working on their, they've been working on their ad platform for the last six years. Yeah, because I get ads in, in Twitter that are like, where and why is this here? Right. And as a marketer, I've experienced with Twitter ads and that's a very, very, very niche kind of category. There's some very niche things that, that work on Twitter and think a lot of stuff does not. So anyway, but that's the power of having that avatar because it allows you to go fish with the right bait to catch the fish that you want, as opposed to pulling a a boot out of the river. You don't want that. Yeah. So. Mm, There's a reason I don't go fishing. (laughs) So that's the importance of the client avatar. Anything less, you're wasting your money. If you don't have an idea of who you're selling to, you're just taking your advertising dollars and just throwing it away. And unfortunately, the, the idea is having a client avatar prevents you from commoditization. What is commoditization? I was just about to ask you that. All right. Because what is commoditized? Yep, that word that Brian just said, commoditization. So when you become a commodity, when your product becomes a commodity, that means anybody can buy it anywhere for the lowest price possible. And uh, unfortunately for business owners, that's pretty, that's a pretty rough place to be because you don't have a specific client laid out in mind. You end up becoming, you know, you're basically all, all you can do is compete on price. Even though you may be having, even though you may be the most high quality product, the most high quality service, if you're competing on price, it's a race to the bottom because somebody's always going to be able to undercut you. So when we think about commoditization, let's look at brands of staplers or brands of staples specifically. Is there a difference between brands of staples in your mind? Nope. Would you be paying more for this brand of staples versus that brand of staples? Nope. I'm looking for the cheapest ones I can buy if I need staples. Right. Because you can get those staples anywhere. Now, if you were some kind of stapler perfectionist and you were really hype about different types of brands of staples, then you might pay up for 
the 15, you know, the, the $15 box of staples versus the five cent box of staples. There's five cents. I don't know how much, I don't know the last time I bought staples. Neither do I. So but, just teasing. You know, but you may pay up for the premium staples if you really know what you're looking for. And here's the thing. The makers of the premium staples have their audience figured out and they figured out our people will pay more for our brand of staples. They have stepped out of that commodity position and put them and position themselves as a premium product. You want to be positioned as the premium product in the eyes of your clients. And so that's why commoditization is bad for you as a business owner. Right now, Brandy and I have these bottles of water. I think we have different brands of bottles of water. If you ask me the difference between these brands of bottles of water, I could tell you the label color is different. I can tell you exactly which store they came from. Yeah, but every store has bottles of water, right? Yeah, but I can tell you which brand. One is Target and one is Kroger's. Right. But if you go to some boutique stores or some fancy pants grocery stores, you can buy a $5 bottle of water. That's the same size as the bottle of waters that we have, right? Yeah. Now, would I go out and buy a $5 bottle of water? Probably not. So we'll, we'll not say $5 bottles of water. We'll say $50 bottles of water. <laughs> yes, but there are. I didn't say there wasn't. You know, there are places that sell $50 bottles of water. And guess what? They ain't commodities. They know exactly who their audience is. They know exactly who they're selling to. They probably even know the names of some of the individuals that are their biggest buyers. The reason why they could charge $50 for those bottles of water is because their audience will pay for those $50 bottles of water. So, you know, it's the difference between the bottle, the pack of bottles of water that you get for nine bucks where you get like 20 of them. And I can tell who does the grocery shopping in the house because. <laughs> How much do you pay for bottles of water? Give me a price point, dear. Listen, I don't buy a package of bottled water unless I can get it for $3 or less. And there's usually 24 to 32 in there of the 16 ounce bottles. Trust and believe. So. So is the difference between the, the, $3? the $3 bottle a pack of 24 bottles of water or the $50 single bottle of water? The people that buy the people that buy the fifty dollars, they're in a they belong to a unique group of people that will pay that much for water. And they like the bottle, the fifty dollar bottle so much that they'll pay a premium premium for it. How many of those you drink in a week? Yeah, well. If you got enough, if you got enough money to buy a fifty dollar bottle of water, you really aren't re- keeping track. Mm, yeah, that is a true statement. You have a refrigerator full of them, and so that's what I'm saying, y'all. And that's the port. That's the importance of nailing your client avatar. You want to know exactly who you're selling it to, because it allows you to set your price point, allows you to really cherry pick what kind of product or service you're going to sell. And it makes sure that your product lines are always in line with what the market is looking for. So that's the importance of client avatar. If you need help with a client avatar, especially when it comes to starting your own podcast, contact us at. Why do I got to keep saying it? <laughs> okay. At mail at isowords.net. Mail at isowords.net. Right. Because the client avatar is really important specifically if if you're getting into podcasting and ISO words can help you start your podcast. So that's what we do. But if it's something you're interested in, we can book a consultation, sit down and, and have a small chat about who you're selling to. If you're looking to book a consultation, visit our website. Right. Isowords.net. And that's how you can reach us. So thanks for tuning in. Hey, y'all, if y'all got any questions about any marketing stuff for me and Brandy, hit us up. We just gave you the email address. I'm not going to do it again because I don't want to endure another eye roll. <laughs> that's okay. You'll endure more eye rolls later today. I'm so it's mail at Isowords. Dot net. Spell it out. M A I L at. Yes, yeah, the at sign. At, you know, little A with the circle around it. I S E L L W O R D S 
dot net. Mail at isowars.net. Hit us up with any question that you, if you have any questions you want us to answer on the show, and we will gladly do it. Well, you know, hopefully we can start building up a pool of questions, and the next next couple of shows might be question and answer sessions. So that's what we got. Thanks for tuning in. If you need a podcast, hit us up. If you have any questions, hit us up, and we will be glad to answer them. So on the next episode, what should we talk about? Because we already talked about avatars. We talked about picking the right channel. Client segmentation. Client segmentation. Maybe we talk about different tools that you can use to segment your clients and the importance of doing that. Yep. All right. So we'll we'll do something along the lines of client segmentation and the different kinds of tools because I mentioned the CRM and I know probably you know a good number of you said oh what that's client relation ma- relationship management software basically it's a database of all your clients and tells you who what they bought and the last time they purchased from you and all that other stuff we can get into that that's Brandy's expertise so she will be doing most of the talking on that one finally so that's what we'll get into thanks for tuning in Hey, it's Brian and Brandy. We're asking y'all, what's the business? Talk to you soon. Bye. Peace.